All right. Well, good morning. Welcome to St. Louis, and welcome to our first CVIPI conference in the Department of Justice. Um, it is amazing to see so many familiar faces. As I mentioned yesterday, it actually feels like a family reunion here. Before we kick off the day, as we have a packed agenda these next two days, I want to just do a little bit of housekeeping rules here. Amazing hotel. We can never predict incidents that could happen, such as fires. So if you look at the exit signs, uh, in the event there's an emergency, please follow the exit signs. There's escalators to our right, you know, from where I sit at, and there are that will lead us to the ground level. There's also a wellness room between 12 and 5 and room Mills 1. I also want to give a shout out to the folks who are managing that because I could only imagine given the content and the, in terms of the material and um, discussion that we'll be having today and tomorrow that there probably will be some things that might be trigger some individuals. And, uh, and so we want to be very mindful about how to support many of you here in this room um, who on a day-to-day -day basis have to encounter specific issues. The other thing that I'll just mention is that we would ask anything worth doing is worth evaluating. And so in this case, we ask that you rate the sessions uh, through the app. If you need assistance with how to download the app or how to manage the, lab, the, the app, please um, reach out to any of our contacts here with DOJ and they could point to the right direction with that. The last thing that I'll say as it relates to housekeeping uh, rules is that tomorrow, uh, we have, as you already know, the Attorney General attending. We're going to ask of you to be in this room by 845 because at 9 o'clock, those doors will close. So don't text me and say, hey, Eddie, how can I get in, right? It's 901. I was only a minute late. Uh, this is beyond my control or any of my colleagues here in this room control. It's a security issue. So we just encourage you to please be in this room tomorrow, uh, 845. Uh, at 9 o'clock, these doors will, will close. Having said all that, it is my pleasure today to introduce an amazing artist who I had the pleasure to be on a couple phone calls uh, over the weekend, who I would say uh, kindred spirit uh, right away. And the fact that she is taking time from a very busy week that she has professionally with the launch of her center, I would really you want to, on behalf of the Department of Justice, thank you for being here. And so without any further delays, I want to introduce uh, Pesha Elaine, who is a visionary in the written and spoken word. She is a St. Louis-based written, visual, spoken, and teaching word artist, which I also have to admit, while she's in St. Louis, she's also born and raised in central Illinois. So for all my Illinoisans too. So, Pasha, please join us at the stage. How we feeling this morning? Nah, how we feeling this morning? In the tradition of my culture and of my community, I will ask for permission from my, from my elders to speak. Thank you. Our ancestors remind us that if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Together, together, to gather like the infinite atoms that gather, then scatter, bonding together to make life matter like the chatter created. When layers of noise are circulated through frequencies of waves and speed from single peeps, we form blended speech together. See, a vessel is only special because of the joined emptiness within, and an army is only alarming because of the ranks of enlisted men. A fist is only clenched by the movement of fingers and wrist. 
And defense is only defense if the links in the chain don't bend. So as we gather together, we don't bend. We do not bend to the belief that we are no more than our greatest mistakes. Because as wind is to leaf, let those mistakes carry us to a greater place in those quiet and loud moments. When the outcome is unknown, when we feel most alone, let us find healing through atonement in the sitting in the stillness, the taking stock of our successes. Because a mistake is only a mistake if you have not learned the lesson. And from the acknowledgement of our accomplishments, from when we first came to this here continent, let us too be cognizant of the prominence of the history of violence and all of its consequence, the ruining of communities, the leveling of legacies, the imposition on our traditions, the erasure of innocence, let us not forget those upon whose shoulders we now stand, those who guided and marched and legislated and planned, those tacticians with vision that circulated those petitions, those who built coalitions to bring this justice to fruition as we gather together, going far and never alone. Let their names be the ones that rest upon our lips. Let their example be the archetype of how we bravely live this marvelous life, not as walking great mistakes, but as vessels of healing, leaving love in our wake together. Yes, as we gather, let this simply not be a way to <clears throat> join the conversation. Let us be the waves and the speed from which the dialogue is born. Let us not simply leave it at the PowerPoint presentations. Let us be the point of power that liberates the nation from the clutches of oppression and violence and calamity. Let us uplift you who are at the front lines of our humanity. And yes, we know we all have our stories of times we have been aggressed upon and of times where we have been the aggressor. But let that not be the tether that binds us together, nor the measure of how we weather our collective forever. These stories, let them endeavor to help make us better. For we are all a collection of pasts, circumstances gathered, lifetimes packaged and bundled. We are all what we have been and at once none of it anymore. For we are reborn every second we accept that we transform through breath and through rest, and through test, and through quest, with open hands of prayer and praise, we as fluid as water, we as limitless as sky, we are grounded as the ground is, we are ground in, rooted together in this community, gathered in love and strength and empathy, as grandmother's hands rub sickness from our bodies, as the light in our children's eyes remind us of the child behind our own. As the spirit of Harriet and Du Bois and Nzinga and Baraka guides us to forge our own way through, gathering together, going farther than we could ever imagine, building bridges at the same time we are walking across them, learning to grow into who we will become, at the same time growing into who we are becoming, reconstructing our spaces in the face of life's phases, the sharing of heritage, the cultural exchanges, though both seen and invisible, like cage birds still singing songs of hope, holding on to ourselves as though our lives depend on it because so often they do. Blessed be ye peacemakers, those who exist everywhere and nowhere at once, finding solace and solidarity against those who can only be at peace when they are at war, effortlessly reflecting what it means to be human, what it means to be because someone else was, what it means to be together, what it means to gather, standing tall, standing resilient, divine, a new picture created from the singular parts of ourselves, collectively crafted, going as far as we can, going as far as we must, gathered in justice and healing and community, gathered in justice, healing and community. Say it with me, y'all. Gathered in justice, healing and community. One more time like you feel it. We are gathered in justice, healing and community here in this place together. Thank you.
Thank you, Keisha. That was absolutely breathtaking. That was a beautiful original expression of what brings us all to this work and to this conference. And you have set the tone for what we have to do over the next two days. <clears throat> so very, very, very grateful. Um, good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm Amy Solomon, the Principal Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Justice Programs. It is a pleasure, it is a privilege to welcome all of you here for the first convenings of the Community Violence Intervention and Prevention Initiative. And uh, as Paige would say, together we gather. We've been looking forward to this day for so long. We've been anticipating the moment when community leaders, federal officials, and philanthropy would come together to discuss community violence intervention as a centerpiece of the public safety infrastructure. To show how important this moment is to the Department of Justice, I am thrilled that we are joined today by our Associate Attorney General, Vanita Gupta, who you will hear from shortly. And tomorrow we will be joined by Attorney General Merrick Garland. I want to thank Commissioner Tracy uh, from St. Louis, who you will hear from shortly as well, for taking the time in uh, his busy schedule in his new city to join us this morning to welcome us to St. Louis and for his deep and long-lasting commitment to public safety. I also want to give out a shout out to Eddie Bocanegra. He is our senior advisor uh, for community violence intervention at Office of Justice Programs. He is the MC for the conference. Many of you know Eddie for his groundbreaking work in Chicago, reducing violence. We are so fortunate to benefit from his expertise and his experience and his deep commitment to this work. I am grateful for Eddie's leadership with this initiative and generally and really just grateful to call him colleague and friend. I'm also so pleased to be joined here today by my close colleagues and the leadership of the Office of Justice of Programs. Uh, here we've got, and if you don't mind standing up, Carlton Moore, the Director of the Bureau of Justice Assistance. If you want, you can hold your applause for the whole group. It's incredible. We've got Liz Ryan, the Administrator for the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency and Prevention. We've got Chris Rose, the Director for the Office for Victims of Crime. We've got Dr. Nancy Lavine, the Director of the National Institute of Justice, and Dr. Alex Baccaro, the Director of the Bureau of Justice Statistics. It, now you can apply. It is, it is really amazing, actually, for all of these directors to be here for these two days, and it shows how important this work is to all of us. Uh, you will hear from them, you will get to know them over the next two days, as well as the amazing staff we have from across all of these offices who have put together this conference. Finally, a very big thanks to all of you uh, for the work that you do every day and for being with here this week. We know that you're needed in your home communities, but we're so grateful that you're here to meet with other CBI leaders, to network, to share ideas and energy. You're also gonna hear more from us about our commitment to you and what we can do specifically to help and support your work and your success over the next months and years. So I'm gonna step back just a moment uh, and tell you that in May of 2021, the Department of Justice released our comprehensive strategy for reducing violent crime and it highlighted investing in community violence intervention as a key pillar. CBI is also a central component of the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, as well as the President's Safer America Plan. But CBI for us is not just a talking point. It is a must-have, a critical set of strategies and models that we know can help stop violence before it happens. The Department's commitment in this area is a testament to the work that you all have been doing for years, and in many cases, for decades. Often without the benefit of robust funding, of the shine of the spotlight, or of dedicated federal support. As CBI takes its place in the national conversation, there are a lot of questions about what CBI is and what CBI isn't. We know CBI takes many forms, and it looks different in every jurisdiction. But ultimately, our frame is about an expansion of community capacity to address the local public safety challenges, and specifically to prevent gun violence. 
Our goal is to invest in community infrastructure and expand the role of community partners as a complement to law enforcement. Our CVI initiative rests on four principles. First, we're trying to reach community members who are at the highest risk of engaging in violence. And we know that these are uh, it's a really hard to reach population. And we're trying to uh, provide, help you provide a wide array of supports and services that will help open up and expand opportunities for them. Secondly, we're being clear and intentional to support CVI as a community-driven, community-centered, and equity-focused effort. We're supporting organizations and collaborators with credibility in your communities, and we know that this is gonna look different in different areas. We expect these investments to be in places like hospitals and schools and CBOs and locally-based community-needed organizations and spaces. Third, we're working to integrate CBI in the larger public health and public safety ecosystem. So our goal here is to build community resilience and social capital so that these strategies remain a permanent part of the landscape. It also means supporting those of you who are doing this work every day, addressing the trauma that you face, and taking steps to protect your well-being over the long haul. Finally, we want to build our base of evidence of what works to save lives. And to ensure that the sustainability of CVI programs, we want to help build your capacity to collect and to use performance data. The Office of Justice Programs is investing unprecedented, dedicated resources in support of these principles and CBI strategies. In fact, thanks to the 22 budget and the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, and to your leadership in this space, uh, this September we were able to award $100 million in grant funding to support CBI programs and research across the country. These are These are programs that you are leading, and it's incredible. This $100 million investment is here in this room. Uh, this is the largest targeted federal investment in these strategies in history, and I hope that it faithfully supports and expands the kind of programs that you have been developing and designing and leading over many years. In this first tranche of awards, there are 47 site-based grants to community-based nonprofits and city-led collaboratives, both to seed new efforts and to expand new ones. We're also supporting three intermediary organizations, the Local Initiative Support Corporation, or LISC, Metropolitan Family Services, and the Latino Coalition for Community Leadership. These organizations are providing funding and capacity building technical assistance to help build up smaller CBOs helping us build capacity and promote equitable access to federal resources in historically underserved communities. This is a new strategy for us, and we are really, really excited and hopeful about it. We're also standing up a CVI PI Field Support Resource Center led by LISC and the Heartland Alliance that will offer free training and technical assistance to any jurisdiction in the country that's interested in CVI, whether they're a federal grantee or not. And then we'll be del delivering tailored support for all of you, our CVI grantees, through the Community-Based Public Safety Collective. You all heard from Akila yesterday. The collective and their partners represent a deep bench and a long track record of successful, effective CVI work. And we know that they're going to be an enormous resource for you and really help us grow the CVI infrastructure. In addition, funds are supporting research and evaluations so that we can better understand what works best to reduce violence and save lives. Collectively, these awards represent just an initial investment. In the next few weeks, we know more is needed. And in the next few weeks, we will be releasing a 23, 2023 new CVI solicitation that will bring more organizations into this network and build the infrastructure even stronger. Now, none of this would be possible without the vision and leadership of people with lived experience, including many of you in this room who are on the ground doing this work every day, often under very challenging circumstances. We're drawing our wisdom and our inspiration from you. And I'm confident that with the impressive collaboration that we're seeing here within and across communities, 
from private partners and philanthropy and through government investments at all levels, we're going to succeed in making community violence intervention a lasting pillar of the nation's response to crime and violence. Yeah. I am so encouraged and I'm so very hopeful that the work that we're doing together will make a profound and lasting difference. We're proud to be your supporters and your partners and we look forward to uh, building on the incredible momentum that all of you have generated. And so with that, it is my great privilege to introduce our next speaker. Many of you know Vanita Gupta as the fierce champion of civil rights and equal justice. She has devoted her entire distinguished career to achieving a goal that sometimes seemed elusive in this country, but she has never given up on, equal rights and equal treatment for all. Her commitment to equity and fairness and to the safety of our communities is second to none. She has been a full and fervent partner in this work, and as the third ranking official at the Department of Justice, she has been a vocal advocate of your work. And that's a huge reason why CVI is a centerpiece of the department's anti-violence strategy. I couldn't be more thrilled that she's joining us today, so please give a warm welcome to the Associate Attorney General of the United States, Vanita Gupta. Thank you for those kind words and important words, Amy, but more importantly for your outstanding leadership. It is a privilege to be with all of you here in St. Louis. Look at this room, it is incredible. Uh, thank you for joining, thank you for gathering here this morning. I wanna thank you, Pesha, for your powerful words. Uh, they're the perfect way to open up this meeting. Captivating, beautiful, and inspiring, thank you. I am so pleased to be here. You don't know. This work has been so important to the Justice Department, and we know how many of you have been toiling away for years and for decades, as Amy has said. I am pleased to be in this room with such an array of people working so hard in your communities. I am pleased to be here with Commissioner Tracy, I know who is just weeks into his position, uh, but who brings such tremendous experience and expertise and connectivity to the communities he's worked in. And I am really pleased that he is and grateful for your commitment to strengthening relationships between the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department and the communities it serves. Eddie, it is wonderful to join you too. I remain grateful for your wisdom and experience that you bring to the Justice Department, challenging us every day with the community violence work that you have done for so long. Your leadership in Chicago, but now for the country, is so incredibly important. And I am thankful to all of you, community violence intervention specialists, law enforcement, public health professionals, service providers, local leaders, and researchers. You have come together from cities across the country to learn from one another to renew your dedication to the health and safety of your communities, and to send a powerful message that we can prevent violence in America through collaboration, intervention, and a collective commitment to change. For too long, our society has looked to law enforcement alone to solve the problem of violence in our communities. We ask police to resolve deep, complex social challenges primarily with the blunt instruments of arrest and incarceration. And every day across the country, police officers are doing everything they can with the tools that they have. But this approach in isolation has not been enough to curb violence in our communities. That is why we included community-based violence prevention and intervention programs as one of the four foundational principles of the Justice Department's comprehensive strategy for reducing violent crime in May 2021. And it is one of the reasons Congress enacted the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. The Justice Department announced yesterday $231 million in funding for, from the act for states to put towards crisis intervention, including extreme risk protection order programs that we know work to keep guns out of the hands of those who pose a threat to themselves or others. 
The Act also provided $50 million in funding for CBI programs, bringing our total investment right now to $100 million. This is geared toward taking a more comprehensive approach, one that takes in the bigger picture and reframes the problem of violence as one in which every member of the community has a stake. It is an approach that centers the very communities that are impacted by violent crime, where community members, local leaders, and law enforcement work together as co-producers of public safety. It is both a strategy and a mindset, and it has the potential to transform our vision of safe and healthy communities. It begins with the premise that violence is not inevitable. It is preventable. When we reject violence as a fixture in our landscape, we see clearly that no person is indispensable. We give up on no one. Community violence intervention and prevention doesn't describe one particular kind of program or project, nor does it include all interventions that seek to address violence. Those of you in this room know that well. And as you heard from Amy, there are some guiding principles for this approach. CVI programs must be community-centered and equitable and inclusive. They must be evidence-informed through research and evaluation, case studies, and expert opinion. And finally, CVI programs must be effective and sustainable. So what does this look like in practice? Many of you have been embodying these principles in your work for years, in some cases decades, and you're continuing to build on it today. You're training and deploying peacemakers in Los Angeles. You're providing mental health services and peer mentoring in Baltimore. And you're providing conflict resolution, mediation, and other critical services to youth in Miami. This is just a snapshot of the different models and programs and projects that comprise CVI. The federal government's historic investment in this approach shows our commitment to working with you and to making sure that we are following the evidence and ensuring that we can have a measurable impact and to continue doing what works. Our approach must and should include law enforcement as vital partners. The work we are doing to build community safety infrastructure is a complement to their work, not in lieu of it. And many of you are working closely with law enforcement in your cities and communities, and I am confident that your work will be more effective and your communities will be better off because of your collaboration and partnership. The CVI work and the approach that you are taking to build and sustain it reminds us that the problem of violence, including gun violence, is not a series of isolated events, but so often the culmination of long-standing unmet needs in our communities. And it helps us rethink how we actually con con conceptualize both the symptoms and the causes. Darcel Clark, the Bronx County District Attorney and one of our partners, spoke recently at a graduation ceremony of the Bronx Osborne Gun Accountability and Prevention BOGAP program in which participants arrested for possessing a gun enter a year-long program with job training, therapy, and conflict resolution skills building, and ultimately have their guilty pleas dismissed, an alternative to a two-year prison sentence. DA Clark told the graduates what many of us have long believed, that their circumstances should not determine their destiny. When we see the full picture, including all of the circumstances that have shaped a person's life, we find ourselves, like DA Clark, rooting for their success. And in keeping with our guiding principles, I should also note that we awarded a grant last year to John Jay College of Criminal Justice to study the BOGAP program, including an assessment of whether successful completion reduces recidivism rates and creates lasting change for participants. Centering the community and looking at the full picture also means acknowledging that neighborhoods with high rates of violence are places that have been for so long underserved. One of our grants is supporting the new Kensington Community Development Corporation in the Kensington neighborhood of Philadelphia, which is facing high rates of unemployment and insufficient housing. 
This grant will help implement a CDI program in Kensington using the Cure Violence model. The model is evidence-based, evidence that has shown statistically significant reductions in gun violence, including a 30% reduction in shootings comparing two years pre-implementation with two years post-implementation. It treats gun violence as a disease, using violence interrupters and outreach workers to detect potential violence and interrupt it before a shooting occurs. It is no secret that black and brown communities have historically been under-resourced and decades of disinvestment have taken a heavy toll. New investments, even the historic investments that we are now making through our grant programs, will not erase the imbalance. Reversing this age-old injustice will take time, but we must be firm in our commitment, and we must be patient and perseverant and persistent. We'll also need to be adaptable. No one intervention or program can solve the problem of violence in our country. Each of you brings unique solutions to difficult, sometimes unique problems. In some cases, you rely on credible messengers with deep ties to their communities and trained to work with those most at risk of engaging in violence. In others, you're focusing on workforce development, social services, cognitive behavioral therapy, or trauma-informed care. None of your programs look exactly alike. And that is both good and important. Tackling the problem of violence in this country needs creative thinking, innovative approaches, and all hands on deck. It needs you. Building community infrastructure helps achieve two vital ends. First, it engenders trust. This is trust among members of a community, between the community and the police, and in the justice system itself, all essential ingredients in the prevention and reduction of violence. Community police trust and justice go hand in hand with safety. Any effort to achieve one without the other is bound to fail, and I say this all the time. Public safety depends on community trust, and it depends on justice. Second, <laughs> second, grounding public safety in the community is the surest way to a fair and equitable system of justice. Community violence exposes long-standing inequities that we cannot ignore. And if we hope to solve the problem of violence in America, we must also deliver on our nation's promise of equal justice. This is not just a new way of doing business. This is a bold rethinking of what safety and justice means in our society. And CVI is one of the many ways that we can empower people to take ownership in their, of safety in their communities and to share some of the burden with law enforcement. Last year, our Bureau of Justice Assistance funded a new effort called Reimagining Justice, a phrase that captures exactly what we're trying to achieve. Through a grant to the Newark Public Safety Collaborative based out of Rutgers University, we are supporting an effort to test new community safety strategies that complement traditional enforcement measures. The mission is to put data and research into the hands of community stakeholders so they can be a part of the design and development of community safety solutions. Co-responder models, which pair law enforcement with behavioral health professionals and community responder programs, which train civilian first responders, are showing promise in a number of our cities. Our Connect and Protect program is supporting these alliances between law enforcement, police departments, and public health experts, and we have seen that they are helping to keep people out of jail and on the road to treatment and recovery. Equal justice and community safety are monumental challenges that have repeatedly, throughout our history, defied solutions. We will not find answers overnight. And we have to be prepared for setbacks and skepticism. And no doubt, you have encountered your share of both. We will learn from the setbacks, looking closely at what works and what doesn't, and finding out why, leaning on data and research to help us adapt and adjust. And we'll have to guard against skeptics who say that crime and violence are matters best left only to the police, at the expense of recognizing the crucial role community members play in co-creating safety. We know, and you have seen firsthand, that community-based approaches to these problems work and will continue to work. That is why one of the central tenets must be the importance and power of rigorous research and evaluation. 
We are deepening the body of evidence so we can broaden our coalition of support and build on the robust groundwork that you have laid and are continuing to lay here today and this week. What you are doing in your communities is remarkable. You are showing people that there are better options than violence and retaliation. You are letting them know that they are more than the trauma that they have seen and suffered. And you are finding a way to bring hope and opportunity into places that have seen too little of either. I am proud that the Justice Department is supporting you in this essential work, work that is making a difference in the lives that you touch and the communities that you serve. And we know that you need to take care of yourselves too as you do this work. I am grateful for all that you do. Thank you for your leadership, for your inspiration, and for your time today. Stay hopeful, my friends. Hearing Vernita sharing the words she shared, as well as Amy Solomon, I just want to, as I sit there and just think about what this field looked like 10 years ago, five years ago, two years ago. We have made so much progress, and yet there's still a lot of work ahead of us. I want to take a quick second to introduce a good friend who I've had the pleasure of knowing when he was in Chicago. And I, I wanted to say, uh, Commissioner, you did forget your Cubs hat uh, when you were back there. So just, uh, just letting folks know. But very much appreciate your work then. And we continue to appreciate your work now as you have been an advocate for this kind of work and the importance of bu building with law enforcement and community, particularly with stakeholders such as those in this room. So it is my pleasure to introduce Commissioner Tracy. Chief Tracy has more than 30 years of law enforcement experience with the New York Chicago Police Department. And now, with St. Louis. Commissioner, please join me. You know, we are in St. Louis, right? If I put this hat on, they'll run me out of town. <laughs> but I am a, I was born and raised in the Bronx, so I'm always gonna be a New York Yankee fan, so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> so any New Yorkers out there. <clears throat> but I will tell you one thing, Eddie. Uh, although I came from New York to Chicago, it finally took a New Yorker to get to Chicago for you to win a World Series when I was there. <laughs> Eddie and I have a really good relationship, as you can see, <laughs> and we can have some fun with each other. I haven't seen each other in a few years, but I, I do miss you, and uh, the type of work that we do is so important. We're having a little fun up here, but this is serious. Serious things that we're doing and really important things that we're doing with our community and working along with law enforcement. Uh, I started about, I started on January 9th. It's a little over 30 days that I've been here now in St. Louis as the new police commissioner. And I'm starting to work with new technology. I usually work off paper with my notes, but um, my new public information people said I got to get used to reading off a tablet. So here I am. So I'm going to try to work on that, and I'm going to ad lib a little bit. So thank you for the opportunity to be here and share the words with you. Uh, as you know, my name is Robert Tracy. I'm the new police commissioner in the St. Louis Metropolitan Police Department. Uh, it's an honor to welcome all of our distinguished guests in St. Louis. Uh, and especially our three speakers before me. Uh, very tough act to follow, but I'm going to try to do my best up here. Uh, the things that we're doing, the Department of Justice being involved in one of their tenants, uh, the Office of Justice Programs, the Bureau of Justice Assistance, uh, incredible work. And, and I've been a partner with them and work with them, and I've gotten grants in our police department. And most of my grants that we've done is involving community violence intervention. Uh, I spent 24 years in the NYPD. Uh, I knew the importance of community policing and us solving issues together to make a safer city, and we've done that in New York. 
uh, went to Chicago where I met Eddie and his team and worked. And you heard about Eddie's success and what he did. So his success was the same thing, was a holistic strategy, not just in policing. We all shared those successes working with the community and building community trust as our third in charge of the Department of Justice said. Uh, we cannot do it without building trust in the community because in policing, we need the community, we are the community, and we have to find ways to do that. And community violence intervention is just is another way of part of being an overall strategy to get to where we need to be. I'd also like to recognize the significant role that community violence intervention plays in what we do. Uh, in Chicago, we make great strides. I just left my last place in Wilmington, Delaware. Wilmington, Delaware, I left January 6th. I started here January 9th. Wilmington, Delaware uh, was called Murder Town, USA. Murder Town, you can look it up. It's a Newsweek article that came out. They did a search for the first time in about 230 30 year history for an outside police chief. I threw my hat in the ring. I ended up being chosen as that police chief, an honor and a privilege. And immediately, my work was to work on internal strategies, community engagement, CompStat, but community violence intervention. And that work that we did and built up, uh, it was painful on some things, it was steps back, but we built the trust that we went through the pandemic, we went through the George Floyd murder, we went through all those things where there was pain in the community, but we were able to overcome a lot of those things and bring that to a safer city and when I left on January 6th, when I say this, we had a 58% reduction in murders. A 50 <laughs> A 50% reduction in non-fatal shootings. Also, about a 35% reduction in overall crime, and even quality of life crimes went down overall. That didn't just happen with the police department. That happened because we worked together we stood up Office of Violence Prevention Programs. We brought in GVI, we worked with Cure Violence, we worked with violence interrupters, we worked with mental health experts, substance abuse, we worked with nonprofits. We all came together. We worked with the schools, education, elected officials, the governor's office, the mayor's office, and we collaborated. And that success is everybody's success. And I come here on January 9th as the new police commissioner here, and all those things I'm bringing with me. And I was fortunate enough, fortunate enough to come to this city where Mayor Jones has already invested and stood up an Office of Violence Prevention. And you'll see him walking around. I don't know if he's going to be one of your speakers, but Director Will Pickney, who ha knows a lot of you in this room. And I've already started collaborating with him and him and I speak every single day about how we can make this better, how my police department can be integrated, how we can be good partners, how we can build that trust to make sure that we can get the same type of results from the department I just left that said it couldn't be done. I was told it couldn't be done. I'm being told that it can't be done here. Well, if you think you can, you think you can't, you're probably right. I think we can. And with the type of work that's in this room and the people that are invested, along with the investment of everyone else that I talked about, and especially my biggest stakeholders, which is my officers, that understand the importance of this. This helps build trust. It also helps make a city safer. Those are the things I promised to St. Louis. And I know everything that we do here, being in New York, being in Chicago, being in Delaware, now in St. Louis, these things that we're doing now are scalable, and transferable. They might not all look alike. They might not all look alike, but I will tell you they're unique, but they have the same basic aspects to what we're trying to do, and then we're making them unique to the area that we're in. So you talk about New York, Chicago, St. Louis, and, and Wilmington, Delaware, which was smaller. But we all did it in our way, and we found ways to get do it. it get, getting it done, and to hear the investment now that we're making as a tenant coming out of this administration, the President of the United States, and the Department of Justice, uh, I'm a big believer in that. And I can't wait to start seeing some of that come in, additional monies, more programs uh, that can help us do our job better and keep St. Louis safer. With that, thank you very much for what you do.
Uh, I'm a practitioner that works alongside you, and I believe in it. And what better thing to have is a police chief that believes in the work that you're doing, uh, because that's how my officers understand what you're doing, because I will make sure I educate them if they don't understand. But a lot of them already do, because we can't do it alone. We know that, and the successes that we've had in the places and the successes that we're going to have here in St. Louis are going to be done because of the work that we're doing together, especially with community violence intervention. With that, this is a beautiful city. I've been here 30 days. <laughs> I have seen such sights and everything, so when you're not in this room and doing things, go out and explore. Go out and look at the museums. Go out downtown. Go out and look at Forest Park, uh, the, uh, the zoo. But there's so many things to do within walking distance. We got something right, I think, right behind us right there. Something big, right? <laughs> I didn't realize how big it was. It's, a, it's an arch. I haven't been inside it yet, but it is huge. So enjoy this city. You'll be hearing from our mayor. She's going to come in and, and probably tell you everything that you should be doing. I'll, leave, I'll let her do that. I've only been here 30 days, so I'm learning as well. But I do know crime. I do know how to, I do know how to make sure I work together with, with groups to make sure we can make a better city or safer cities that I've been in. And I really believe in this work. And thank you, thank you, thank you for the work that you're doing. Please enjoy St. Louis. Good luck at this conference. Thank you, Commissioner, for all your due diligence and your work in this, in this field. I'd like to uh, welcome the audience here and to acknowledge a couple of things as we're setting up the stage. If you've been doing this work, if you've been doing street outreach, mentoring, mental health, hospital-based, housing, research, and a number of different things that I'm missing, been doing this for over 25 years. Please stand up. Please remain standing. Please remain standing. If you've been doing this work for over 15 years, please stand up. If you've been doing this work for 10 years, please stand up. Five years. Five years, please stand up. And if you're new to this, which I met a few yesterday, please stand up. Thank you. When I heard our amazing speaker this morning, Pesha, talk about an army, this is the army of peacekeepers. I don't know what you see, but what we see is what exactly what Pesha described in her powerful words. We see an army of peacekeepers.